because of sharing. Hello, everyone. It's 1230 Central Standard Time, and we're starting up the Traffic Corner Tuesday. Uh, it is still March Madness. I have Gonzaga winning it all, the only one in the office pool, so I'm still alive. Hopefully, you're alive in your pool as well. Just a few housekeeping things to start off the Traffic Corner with. Please you, mute your mics uh, so we don't get a lot of noise and different people chatting. Uh, feel free to jump into the conversation, though, and type your questions into the chat feature. We'll keep track of those. And uh, today's Traffic Corner Tuesday is brought to you by Spike SPAC Enterprise. That was embarrassing since I'm Mike SPAC. Um, not used to doing this intro part. Nancy's out of town and I'm taking over. Uh, SPAC Enterprise, as most of you know, uh, we have a consulting arm, SPAC Consulting. We sell traffic counting equipment at Counting Cars. We do data collection at Traffic Data Inc. And we have a couple of other places where we share information as well. So a little bit more housekeeping. Today we will be talking about an acceleration lane case study we did for MnDOT. Uh, it was a fun project for us, a research project. So right in our wheelhouse, uh, coming up in a couple weeks, we'll be talking about 85th percentile speeds. And then at the end of April, we're going to be rolling out uh, and sharing with you kind of a preliminary traffic assessment tool we use on our projects and we share with our clients. It's kind of a checklist we go through right at the beginning of a project just to flag any big traffic issues. So today's presenters are going to be uh, two of my right-hand men. Uh, Brian Fisek is the vice president of SPAC Consulting and he really runs the consulting operations. He has 20 years of experience as a PTOE, has designed a bunch of roundabouts, uh, done traffic studies for baseball stadiums, really has a great breadth of traffic engineering knowledge. And then Max Moreland has been with us for six years out of college and uh, Max spends about two-thirds of his time as a traffic engineer doing studies but also a third of his time he runs Traffic Dead Inc. He's the director of operations and keeps everything organized and does the is responsible for all the quality control. So today's project is in the wheelhouse of these two guys. Uh, the case study it was heavy data collection project and then some really interesting analysis. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bryant and Max. All right, thank you. Hi again, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, we're going to roll right into our presentation on this case study then. And now we are. <laughs> A little delay on the slide click there. Uh, so very first, just definition of what we're talking about, median acceleration lane, uh, mall if you want to abbreviate it. Uh, but what we're talking about is where you have a wide median on your main line and you are, you put an acceleration lane in there, put that inside acceleration lane so anyone turning from the side street making that left turn, they can turn to the inside. Anyone making that U-turn, they can turn around going to that one and the idea behind it is you have this time to accelerate up to speed while the main line is going by so it's ideally and theoretically a way to have these vehicles turn into a separate lane and allow them to get up to speed and merge over safely without having to wait for a full gap in traffic on both sides. Um, in Minnesota the MALs or balls are commonly used for heavy truck traffic. It you know, obviously it takes a longer time for a big truck to accelerate up to speed, so having those, um, I guess the idea behind them is for allowing trucks to get in those lanes and get up to speed uh, so they can merge safely onto the, onto the main line. Um, so then, I guess the purpose of the study was to answer a few different key questions we had. Uh, the first one is, when are these median acceleration lanes used? Um, do people use them at all? <laughs> are they more used uh, in certain times of the day? Um, and along with that, we also asked the question, what's the difference in usage between cars and trucks? Um, as I just mentioned, uh, they are kind of 
intended in a way for large trucks to be able to use them. Um, so do cars use them as well? And does one use them more than the other? Um, uh, bonus on the last one. If you notice, the steering wheel was on the wrong side of that car. Uh, just throw that out there. Third question we had, what amount of traffic or does the amount of traffic influence their use? So we just got a typical graph there. You can see, recognize the AM, PM peaks, little peak over lunch. That could be any street. But for these, does it make a difference if we have a higher peak traffic? Are they used during those peaks and not during other times? What was the, the variance there? And then finally, as we look at crash records for our sites, do they show an improvement from a before and after staying point of we put them in and it helped out, we were able to improve that safety or saw less crashes than the before time or less compared to similar sites. So those are the four key questions for our study, what we were looking at, really what we were trying to find and, and figure out. So I think if you look at all those, you really boil down to, are, are we getting our money's worth out of these lanes? Is yeah. it worth putting them in or are they not doing what we think they're doing? So I said at the beginning, they theoretically help safety, they theoretically help operations. And so that's what these key questions are trying to get to is, are we helping the situation out and are we getting our money's worth? Um, so we looked at 12 different locations around Minnesota. Um, I'm just kind of click through and kind of show you where they're located. Um, they're kind of a mix of locations. A, B, and C are near St. Cloud, which is a medium-sized city. E and F are right in the metro area. And then um, the other ones are kind of spread out in more rural areas. So we got a mix of higher volume roads near the metro, some medium volume roads, and then some lower volume roads. Um, all of these were four-lane highways with wide medians to accommodate the median acceleration lane. Speed limits on the main lines are 55 to 60 miles an hour. Um, the mean acceleration lanes at all these spots were about 1,000 feet in length, and most of them had been in operation for at least a few years. Um, the ADT kind of ranged all over the place, too. So they were very similar in design, but we did have a, a mix of traffic volumes on them. So we... We felt this was a good sample size in terms of not only locations, in terms of the kind of the metro area here, larger population, with that a little bit larger volume on them, along with more of the rural areas and a little bit less volume, a little bit higher truck volumes in some of those areas. So again, really trying to get that mix of site, but all very similar in their base design of how they're set up at the intersections. All right, so moving on to how we did this. So we have these long acceleration lanes. We need to figure out how to collect all this volume to answer our questions. So we, we had a little bit of internal talking about this one. This was proposed. Mm -hmm. um, it was thrown at us from MnDOT, and they basically threw out, this is what we want to do. How could you get that done? So we had, a, like I said, a lot of internal talking about what's the best way to get this done, what's the best way to capture all the data we want. So what we settled on was first getting the mainline volume. Uh, just on the mainline, that traffic volume was available from MnDOT. So we didn't have to collect that volume. They provided it to us. They had recent counts that, that worked for what we needed. So then we looked at what we need on the side street. We said we put two counters out there. Nice picture of Max there. Uh, this is not at one of the sites, <laughs> but it is representative of just putting that, that tube counters down on the side streets, and that was to gather all that traffic volume. We got it by 15-minute uh, period, or we had it by any period we wanted. Yep. I mean, yeah, once... we kind of broke it down in hourly periods. We collected it for a, a whole week, so we yeah. had uh, seven days of data on each of the side streets, Oops. and we got volume, speed, and class classification data with those tubes. Yep, so collecting all that down on the side street. And then the next portion was setting up cameras. Nice shot of Max setting up a camera again. Uh, in this case, we had our first one kind of in the corner, 
peering across, across from the acceleration lane, being able to capture those movements so we could specifically count how many people turned left, how many people took the U-turn. So that was a big part of it is we had the total volume on the sides and we had that classification, but now with the cameras, we were able to go in, look at the left turns, look at the U-turns, and, and specifically count each of those separately, divide them into the trucks, passenger cars. We also looked for farm vehicles just to see if there were some differences there. And then we set up another camera at the end of the acceleration lane. So we told you the length of this lane is about 1,000 feet. So set up the camera here. And what this allowed us to do is really look at the camera, look at the operations, and provide a, a binary choice as we counted them. So as a person took a left turn from this side street, it was very basic. We marked it down. What type of vehicle was it? Passenger car, truck, farm vehicle. And did they turn into the acceleration lane or did they turn into the main line? So very easy to keep track of, very quickly. You can quickly identify that and, and move through the video pretty quick. For the second camera, we had it pointed at the end. And again, we set that up as a binary choice. Was the vehicle in the acceleration lane, did they follow it to the end or did we see them merge out before? So that allowed us to not only get the number of people who had the opportunity to use this lane, but then figure out where they turned in and did they use the whole lane or not. So we thought it was a pretty good way to capture that data, capture really the key points that we needed uh, without having to do multiple camera setups all over the place, without yeah. having to capture all the traffic through the intersection. We had the tube counts. We had that data from MnDOT. So it was really trying to look at it. How can we capture as many sites as we want, as economically as possible, keep the cost of the project down, but still get all the data we need to, to review and, and make some good uh, analysis and conclusions from it. Yeah, and these cameras are also out for a week along with the tube counters. Um, so a week <clears throat> at 12 locations, there was a lot of data there. So yeah. we, we were trying to figure out how, how can we get uh, just the right amount of data. I know there are ways you could do it where you could a ton more, track individual vehicles from A to B, but uh, we thought this was a pretty good approach. Um, and we did have that set up for a week too, and it was mainly just to see, again, as we looked at the, the differences, is there a difference between weekday, weekend, as mm -hmm. that volume goes up and down? So grabbing it for the full week allowed us to look at all the different days, average that information all out, see if there were discrepancies on one day or another, and uh, like Max just said, lots of data. So since we had all of our stuff out for a week, we did run into a few issues, um, just having kind of our portable equipment out for such long periods of time. Um, we ran into some, some bad weather here and there. One time it snowed. We had some high winds that would shake the cameras around. And then we had one that made me jump when I saw it. Uh, a bird attacked one of our cameras um, just hours after it was set up. So we lost the whole week of data there and had to go reset it. But yeah, I was scrolling through this video, and then this bird comes flying in, and I jumped out of my chair. So that was fun. <laughs> yeah. One thing that was nice, though, is we did have we did have those problems with the weather and the birds, but uh, no vandalism. So we pretty much got through. Nobody nobody came out and cut our tubes. Nobody right. pulled the camera down or anything like that. So you know, while so, we did have some problems, it was nice that. Uh, at least people weren't being horrible to us, just just nature. Yeah, yeah. even though we had to reset, <laughs> we still got our, all of our equipment back at the end of the project. So with with all that and wanting to capture everything on the, the same time, obviously we wanted the, the tube data with the cameras. We wanted all that to sync up. We did have to go back there a couple times. So this wasn't an easy process. We did have to go back out to sites a couple times. And there were a couple sites where we didn't get the full week that we wanted. We ended up with five and a half or six days, but right. we deemed that good enough on on average. So this was a this was a great point of working with MnDOT and them working with us, frankly, and really looking at what we had collected, what we were trying to get, and deciding whether we had enough or not. And 
just working together on that to, to get what was needed and not having to continually go out there to try to capture everything. So that brings us to the results. Um, here's just a quick chart showing the overview of all of the sites kind of averaged together of what we got. As you can see, um, a lot of passenger cars in blue, or no, sorry, passenger cars on the left have vehicles on the right. Um, a majority of vehicles are using the median acceleration lanes, um, and a non-majority are using them for the entire length. You can see that um, about 80, 80-something 80, 80 of uh, passenger cars use it, whereas a little under 80 percent of heavy vehicles use the acceleration lanes, but the heavy vehicles do use them for their entire length more often than a passenger car, as we, you know, speculated at the top of this presentation. You can also see a little bit here that we get a jump in the graph when we go to, on the left here with passenger cars, we have over the course of the day, and then we have the peak hour for that period. Same with the heavy and the vehicle. Heavy vehicles, daily, peak hour. You can see a little bit of a jump in there, which again, I think is pretty intuitive that as the volume goes up, more people are going to use that. Uh, they're able to. They can jump in there, get through the intersection faster. Yeah, as we mentioned, some of these sites are in kind of rural locations. So at 11 a.m. in the middle of kind of nowhere, I don't want to say nowhere because it's somewhere, but in somewhere <laughs> rural, um, you know, turning into the meeting acceleration lane when there's no one on the main line, you know, take it or leave it. Again, this was a summary for everything there. Um, just some more results here. We did some charts like this where just looking at here's all our different sites along the bottom. We had those 12 different sites. You can see how we graph it between them, what's being used, heavy vehicles, um, heavy vehicles in orange or yellow again, passenger cars in blue, and just looking at those percentages, how they bounce around at the different sites, uh, kind of the previous one was the average. This expands that and says this is what's going on um, over the course or at each individual site. And we've got, again, that, that daily and that side street peak hour there. So a couple different ways to look at it. Um, again, these are averages over the course of that entire week. So you know, we're just showing you a little bit of the glimpse of the charts that you can put together here. This would be a statistician's dream with all the data yeah. we collected. And yeah. um, Max was the one who poured through all that and, and really tried to nail down these different things, pulling out different percentages, looking at a Monday versus a Tuesday or a Saturday, Sunday, kind of making all those different comparisons and trying to figure out, based on what we're looking at, what does all this boil down to? What does it mean? So that leads us right into kind of our analysis, pulling all that data back, what we were looking at. As we just said, most of the vehicles use the acceleration line. So that was kind of a good finding, just, hey, people are using them. Yeah. It's, we're not putting the pavement down there for nothing. It's, it's getting used. Yep. More cars. More cars using it compared to heavy vehicles. This was interesting because, as we said at the beginning, these are intended for heavy vehicles, or at least that was part of the reason why they were put in in the first place. So just an interesting note that more passenger cars are using them percentage-wise compared to heavy vehicles. Uh, most, as we saw in the charts, most vehicles do not use the entire length of the median acceleration lane, but comparing heavy vehicles to passenger cars, more heavy vehicles do use them as you would kind of anticipate. Um, during the peak hours, as Brian mentioned just a few minutes ago, the median acceleration lane is, usage is higher than over the course of the day, as to be expected with higher volumes on the, on the main line. It's a lot easier to turn into an empty lane. Um, we also kind of charted the main line ADTs versus the MLL usage, um, and it was kind of all over the map, a big scatter. So there wasn't a real strong correlation between the two. Um, Intuitively, we'd think if there's a higher ADT on the main line that more people would use the median acceleration lane, but that turned out to not be a, the case, um, at least statistically. 
it was based a little bit more on the side street ADT and the and the peak hour volume. So we saw with the with the peak hour volume that usage went up, but just overall looking at the daily volumes, that wasn't a good predictor of usage based on each of the sites. So if one had 10,000 vehicles a day compared to 15,000, we couldn't make an accurate prediction that way. Now, one thing we didn't talk much about earlier is we did gather crash data. Minnesota has a nice program. We've got crash data for the whole state. We were able to get in there and pull that data out for each location, look at comparative sites, look at a little bit of before history. And there was this couple stats here that the fatal and severe crashes went down, a 50% decrease comparatively to without that acceleration lane. Um, conversely, conversely, the overall crash rate at the sites with the median acceleration lane is about 18% higher than the similar sites without the median acceleration lanes. So it's kind of a, it's a weird finding as you try to think about it, just um, you would think it would help out for both, but uh, there could be some reasons that we need to get into of why that total crash rate went up. Maybe side swipes went up, maybe uh, not understanding the usage, but <clears throat> excuse me, but because they were moving the same way, they were closer to speed together or something, you know there, there could have been some reasons for that that one went up and one went down. just a little bit odd finding, not what we would have expected right away. Right. All right, so this is going to be a little bit of a repeat here, but just getting back to those conclusions, coming back to the questions, you know, what, what did we find from this? Did we answer our questions? And yeah, the acceleration lanes are used by a majority of drivers. They appeared to decrease those fatal severe crashes, although uh, the total went up. Um, yeah, and MnDOT uh, helped with pulling this crash information. They're still kind of, they're still looking at everything and still digging into it. So we don't want to say for sure that this is a, the meaning acceleration lane causes more crashes or decreases crashes. But they're still kind of digging into those numbers, figuring out what is statistically significant or not. There was a previous study of these done about a decade ago, 12 years ago, some, somewhere in that range, and we did some comparisons and we found some similar findings in terms of the, the usage, the percentage of uses, that comparison between the passenger cars and trucks. So it was a validation of that earlier study that um, it's still true today. Uh, did noticeably though, it didn't see a, a market increase so as we looked at the percentages, could have thought that maybe, um, maybe as people got used to them, that that usage went up as they learned more about them, understood what they were for, but um, didn't see enough of a change to make that conclusion. <clears throat> and then finally, just more work is needed on them. Um, we need to dig into those crashes a little bit more. To really figure out what the uh, really figure out what the statistically significant crashes might be. Is there a correlation between them? And then also, <clears throat> excuse me again, just a follow up on it too. Does it help with capacity? That's one aspect we didn't get into that would be good to follow up with. So those were the basic conclusions. I do see one question here. Let's get to that one real quick. Is there a, oh, we got a couple questions here. Is there any data showing that an 18% increase in overall crash rate goes down over time? This would assume learning curve. Uh, I guess it's possible. We don't have anything. <coughs> offhand in that. Uh, we looked at all of these locations we looked at have been out there for a few years. So we looked at data from 20, 
2013 to 2015, um, as well as some of the locations have been out there longer. So we had data from I think as far back as 2009. Um, so I guess that's not something we really looked at. Yeah, that was more time. It was just kind of an aggregate. Yeah. So that that's another one again. Getting back to more work needed. That'd be good to separate that out. What do the crashes look like year to year as opposed to over yeah. the whole period? That's a good question. Another question, is there a range of ADT on the main line where they are most effective, ADT threshold where it's not recommended? As we kind of mentioned before, we didn't really see a huge, just looking at the correlation of usage versus ADT, um, it wasn't super strong. And so, I don't know, I don't, I don't think we can say based on what we've done definitively that uh, there is a range where they are best. Yeah, it should be noted that all these sites were four-lane roads, so typically they're going to be 10,000 or above. We were probably in the range of 10 to 20, I think was our... 20, something in the 20s. Maybe the low trial. 20s. Uh, so we did have a big range there. Um, but yeah, I, I guess as I would look at it, as I would look at it, I would say these are useful. They're being used by a majority of people. We do see some safety advantages, like we're just looking at the crash. We do need to look at that a little bit more. Intuitively, I would say that operations should get better with them because they don't have to look for that full gap in traffic from both directions. They're able to look for a gap in one way, turn into the acceleration lane, get up to speed and merge over and, and do that jockeying for position in the acceleration lane. Um, and then also for trucks being able to get up to speed before they move over. So I don't know if I'd necessarily look at ADT as opposed to what are you trying to accomplish with it and what does your intersection look like? Are you, do you have a heavy truck volume that you're seeing crashes with truck, uh, rear ends to truck, they turn left and someone comes right up behind him and hits them. So I, I, I think the better way to look at it is using them as a tool to solve a problem. Right. Next question we have, is there signage in the median to make drivers aware that it exists? Yeah, there is some typical signage for it. There's warning signs that it's a merge over on the main line. Uh, more important on the main line from the main line, I think, is the side street to let people on the side street know that they're there. And there is some uh, there is some minor signing on there. I can remember it on a couple sites, so I can't. Can you remember exactly what it is? It says, uh, "Oh my gosh, put it on the spot." <laughs> I think it says like truck acceleration lane. 1,000 feet or 500 feet or however. There's something like that. So there are some warnings. The, the striping is also there to try to help people out where right. you get the, uh, not the typical dash between lines, but that dotted, that thicker, shorter yeah, dash shorter line dashes. to let people know that the lane is going to end. So there is some standard signing and striping that goes with it that um, is supposed to help drivers figure that out if they know it's there. Uh, but that also gets back to education, and so I think that would also be uh, probably a takeaway is if you're looking at a site, you should be uh, providing some education, letting people know it's out there. Uh, next question as we start to reach the end here is what were the actual number of crashes and then that fatal and injury crashes? Um, without having the numbers right in front of me, I recall that the crash rates, the overall crash rates were about three or sorry, 0 0.3 uh, to 0 0.4 um, crashes per million entering vehicles. And then the fatal and type A injury, the severe crashes, there was, at all the sites in the past few years, there was only a handful, um, so five or less. And that's why that one's not statistically significant, why we can only say it appears to decrease those crashes, because... Um, it's not like we're dealing, thankfully, it's not like we're dealing with tons of these crashes and then right. we saw a market decrease. There may have been three or four compared to two or three. I mean, so we're, 
there was a decrease, but is that a random occurrence or yeah. can we see that sustained over time? So, all right, with that, we have hit uh, one o'clock here and we've reached the end. So thank you everyone for your um, attendance. Uh, I see another question come in. So just quickly before we get to that, we'll answer all the questions if anybody wants to hang on the line. We'll also send this out as we usually do so people can review it as needed. But if you need to go, uh, again, thanks for your attendance. Uh, our next one will be, well, the date's not right, but, uh, oh, that's this one. That's, yeah. We're doing it again. We're <laughs> all right, so we didn't update that. Next one will be in two weeks, early part of April. Um, so we hope you'll join us again. So Any thank you very much. Um, getting back to the questions here. So one more, are there merge arrows on the pavement with the merge warning signs? Yes, that's pretty standard. Uh, so on the main line, you would see, you'd see that striping at the end of it. There were, I believe two of kind of the diagonal arrows, um, that, help people to merge over so uh, yes that stuff is on there to, to help help people recognize they're coming to the end of the lane all right with that seeing no more questions on there again thank you everyone for attending and we hope to see you again in two weeks yeah thanks everyone